Africa does and a little bit about us. We'll also be covering an introduction to sustainability and uh, then we'll narrow into sustainability and HR. Then we'll take a break. Then we'll discuss the use of the GRI standards, have, uh, have a group activity and presentations. And then we'll also get your feedback on the session. So who is MK Africa? Um, you've known about us, the people on the call, uh, but maybe you are not aware of what the company does. So MK Africa is a consultancy that offers training, strategy development, and communication services for the sustainable development goals, as well as sustainability to companies looking to create measurable economic, environmental, and social impact. So that's who we are. We aim to become the to become Africa's most respected sustainability communications consultancy. And our mission, of course, is to offer excellence in sustainability communications across Africa. Um, this call is also part of our mission um, by empowering you, we will increase the reach of sustainable practices across various businesses on our continent. Aside from what I have mentioned, our various products and services also include leadership coaching, ESG thought leadership events, and sustainability innovation. Um, a little bit about this is more encouragement towards um, various individuals in various sectors on how to think about sustainability from the end user's perspective, as well as to enhance businesses, business longevity in, in the scope of their work. We'd also invite you to check our website um, to learn more about what we do. We also offer a unique positive contribution through our initiative, hashtag my little big thing. Uh, this was inspired by Wangare Madai's little thing of planting trees. So in the my little big thing uh, initiative, we train young persons on the SDGs and sustainability, as well as the design challenge so that they can come up with sustainable businesses um, for their fellow youth, as well as to tackle the challenges faced in the country, as well as Africa. So we operate under three pillars, uh, that is education, training, education and training of youth on the sustainability and SDGs, as well as offering thought leadership as mentioned. It's also an opportunity for various of various partners to advance in sustainability leadership as sponsors, mentors, and trainers in the program. Um, as mentioned, we do provide reporting services. And as you can see on the screen, these are lists of our clients. We've worked with Total Energies Marketing Kenya, HFC Group, HF Group through HFC Bank. Uh, we've also worked with Sassini PLC, who have recently launched their sustainability report. The HF Group has also launched in the month of May. Um, we've also worked with Centum Group, uh, and currently we are working with PHC and Kenya Airways. Um, for our training, we have um, in addition to this call, we've also had various training with other companies. We've had um, an in-house CBA training in 2022. We've also trained Umeme Limited Uganda, um, as well as Britam. Um, in addition to my little big thing, we've also worked with Yali, uh, that is East, West and Southern Africa to also host for them design challenges to find digital solutions to waste management. 
And as I've mentioned, we, we also trained our reporting clients on using the GRI standards. So that is Total Energies Marketing Kenya, HFC, and Sassini. We also had a training with Citibank on sustainability and ESG reporting. In case you would like to find out more about us, um, we'd encourage you to um, check out our website, check out our socials, join our mailing list so that you can get updates. And in case you have any questions, please feel free to leave them on the chat. Now I will hand over to Marcy to start us off with the webinar. Over to you, Marcy. Thank you. Thank you so much, Patricia, for that introduction of us in the MK Africa group and what we do. Thank you, Mirka Druyo. I'll take this chance to welcome you to the introduction to sustainability, where we are going to cover the concept of sustainability and also related and linked terms to sustainability, such as the ESG, that is environmental social and governance. We're also going to cover terms like the sustainable development goals uh, and uh, the C CSR. Those are some of the terms that are very common when you're discussing the concept of sustainability. So welcome, and my name is Marcy. So to start with, uh, I would like us to ask ourselves from our personal perspectives and where we, the organizations that we represent, what sustainability could mean for us, for each one of us. When uh, the word sustainability is mentioned, what comes to your mind? So think about that as we go through this topic. So to start with, sustainability is a concept that is often used interchangeably with the word sustainable development. They are uh, relatively the same, but the difference, so there's a small difference. So when you talk about sustainability, we are referring to development that meets the needs of the present generation without compromising the ability of the future generations to meet their own needs. But basically, sustainability is a long-term perspective, but when you talk about sustainable development, then it refers to the many processes or pathways uh, that help an organization to achieve the long-term goal that is now sustainability. So the, the UN Assembly thought that the environmental problems were global in nature and determined that it was the common interest of all nations to establish policies for sustainable development. It therefore established the uh, the Black Land Commission in 1983 to reflect about ways to save the environment and natural resources while preventing the downturn of economic and social development. Now, this commission uh, was public, uh, sorry, published a report that contained the most uh, used definition of sustainability that you have just highlighted as a form of development that will help the current generation or the present to meet their needs while also not compromising the ability of the future generations to meet their own needs. So when we talk about sustainability, it is based on three concepts that is economic, environment, and social. The sustainable development, development refers to the broader environmental and social interest rather than to the interest of just the interest of specific organizations. In this session, the term sustainability will be used interchangeably with uh, sustainable development. Although, as I have mentioned, sustainable development, I will refer to uh, the processes or pathways that help achieve that long-term goal, which is sustainability itself. 
So sustainability has, as a concept has a long history. Individual countries were, were unable to deal with sustainability issues affecting the whole world, but the United Nations carried out the sustainability has been carrying out the sustainability agenda for over 50 years is evident in the various conferences that they have hosted on sustainability. You can see, hopefully from your skin, you're able to see the UN conferences began way in 1972, when we had the Human Environment Stockholm, uh, sorry, the UN Conference on Human Environment in Stockholm, Sweden. Then in 1992, the UN held the UN World Conference on Sustainable Development in Rio de Janeiro. Then in 2002, there was the UN World Summit on Sustainable Development uh, that was hosted in Johannesburg. Then in 2012, there was the UN Rio Plus 20 Conference on Sustainable Development. And then all this culminated in the 2015 UN Agenda 2030 and the sustainable development goals. I know this, the 2015 is uh, more relatable to most of us, but it happened after a consequence of other uh, conferences. So we are going to cover in a bit in details about this, uh, the UN agenda that will, uh, that, uh, develop the 2030 SDGs. As we may be aware, the Sustainable Development Goals are 17. And uh, these were agreed on by 193 countries that collaborated in the mentioned 2015 conference that designed and launched the 17 SDGs to facilitate a practical approach to global sustainability challenges. Now, the SDGs were born out of what is, uh, by many arguably, the inclusive process in the history of uh, UN, reflecting substantive input from all sectors of society in all parts of the world. The, the 17 SDGs can be categorized into five P's uh, and these are people, prosperity, planet, peace and partnership. As you may have realized when you defined sustainable development, we mentioned the environment aspect. You also mentioned economy and social, but uh, with the SDGs, there are two extra important components that come into play. That is the peace and partnership. Those are uh, the two last pieces that were integrated in the 2030 agenda. So when you talk about the SDGs, we have these five P's, people, prosperity, planet, peace, and partnership. So with people, here we talk about the SDGs that relate or impact have direct impacts on people. We have ending poverty and hunger in all its forms and dimensions and ensuring that all human beings can fulfill their potential in dignity and equality and in a healthy environment. That is the aspect of people. We have several SDGs that, uh, that are under the people, like SDG number one up to four, that is on no poverty, SDG on uh, health and well-being, an SDG on uh, ending hunger, all this relates to people. Then we have the second P, prosperity. This involves ensuring that all human beings can enjoy prosperous and fulfilling lives and that uh, economic, social, and technological progress occur in harmony with nature. Then we have the planet. These are SDGs that relate to protecting the planet from degradation, including through sustainable consumption and production, 
sustainably managing its natural resources and taking urgent action on climate change so that it can support the needs of the present and future generation, the concept of sustainability again. Then we have the, the, the other P that is peace, fostering peaceful, just and inclusive societies which are free from fear and violence. There can be no sustainable development without peace and no peace without sustainable development. That is uh, what the peace uh, agenda reflects. Then we have partnership, the last P. This involves mobilizing the means required to implement the agenda through revitalizing the global partnership for sustainable devel development based on the spirit of strengthened global solidarity focused in particular on the needs of the poorest and the most vulnerable and with the participation of all countries and stakeholders across the world. So those are the five P's that are embedded in the sustainable, the 17 sustainable development goals. Then the SDGs call for a worldwide action among governments, businesses, and civil societies to end poverty and create a life of dignity and, and opportunity for all. So governments and regulators ma uh, materialize their positive contribution with the guidance of the 2030 agenda and the SDGs and all policies on uh, national level. So we may ask, as we may ask ourselves now, we have talked about government, governments and regulators, but then what about our organizations or compared, uh, small, the small and medium enterprises, where do they lie? But now this is the challenge. So every organization has its place in ensuring that it undertakes its activities in a sustainable manner. And this is what we call the sustainability challenge. No matter the size of your company, even at an individual level, there is a space for you to act and ensure that you contribute to sustainable development. So we are going to explore what sustainability further means for a business. So in a business case, sustainability is not just about reputation management or PR or public relation. When you, you, you determine or establish that you want to embed sustainability in your organization, you are not doing it to, for appearance or for PR. It is a business strategy that you have decided to incorporate like any other business strategy that organizations have. Greenwashing is spending more time and money claiming to be green. green. Because environmentalism has become a trade, some businesses may follow along with it for appearance sake. And many apply the term greenwashing to any publicized environmental claim. And this is likely to come from a growing distrust of the large corporations. So in either case, corporate greenwashing describes companies distracting from their unsavory behavior by promoting their sustainable ones. Whether intentional or not, it can have some adverse effects on both the environment or business. So this, sustainability concept for a business, it shouldn't be done for PR because the effects could be adverse for the business and for the environment. But when it is incorporated as a strategy, then it brings the benefits that were intended. So the, I don't know if my screen is visible. 
Sorry for that. So I believe this is the entire idea about sustainability and how it links to a business model. And so the next concept the next concept that we'll cover is to see the difference between sustainability and CSR, that is the corporate social responsibility, as these terms are often confused. So sustainability is not the same as CSR, while corporate social responsibility is more of the, <coughs> sorry, more of uh, philanthropy or the giving part of the business, sustainability addresses how the organization uses a strategic advantage to reap benefits in the long term. There are, however, intersections between CSR and sustainability when it comes to issues like community relations or staff welfare, or even uh, communication and the protection of environment, you may find a CSR activity may end up being uh, a sustainable pathway. So they are inter, they could be interlinked in a way, but they also have that differences in that sustainability is long term, while CSR is the giving part or the philanthropy part of the government. So I hope we are together so far at this point. I would like us to take a reflection question. At a personal level, I want us to reflect on your organization. What would you say are the distinctions between public relationship Sorry, public relations, corporate social responsibility, and sustainability. Just reflect on these concepts from your organization con uh, context and see how you would make the distinctions for PR, CSR, and sustainability. So I believe with the content, content we have covered, you are able now to see the differences these three concepts may mean for your company. You're able to see what you do as a company, what could be for PR, what is what falls under CSR or giving, then what you may feel uh, belongs to sustainability. I hope this is now very clear from each of your organizations. Uh, context. So we are going to continue the concept of sustainability. As a recap, you remember you said it's part of the business strategy and it uses the day-to-day -day management decisions to address socio-economic and environmental issues arising out of the company's operations. So you remember the three uh, concept of a, the environment, uh, the economy, and social that comprises the sustainability con uh, component. So sustainability involves measuring impact with the aim of improving business performance. Now, it is increasingly important for businesses to understand how social and environment, environmental changes may pose risk for the resilience of their supply chains, operations, as well as their markets. So when you look at sustainability and uh, business, there's another, there are three components that we look at when you are looking at uh, 
business and sustainability, we have the concept of bottom line. Initially, this is the traditional accounting method for a business where organizations are interested in profit and losses, but with sustainability, other than profit, we bring in the components of the planet and people. We shift from the bottom line or of accounting for profit or loss only to incorporating people and planet. So over the last 50 years, environmentalists and social justice advocates have struggled to bring a broader definition of a company's bottom line by introducing the full cost accounting. This is called the triple bottom line or the TBR, or some people may call it 3BL. That is the triple bottom line. It, this means accounting, an accounting framework that uh, puts into, into consideration the social, environmental, and financial uh, aspects of business, unlike the traditional framework where we had only profits or losses being considered. However, the challenge that is being faced is that business executives are claiming that they would like to do much more and achieve the 3BL, but their hands are tied by limited mandates given to them by their investors, or by the policymakers, or even the customers. But this thinking, which is commonly known as short terminism, uh, cannot be sustainable. So short terminism is where short term performance pressures results in a excessive focus on quarterly earnings with less attention paid to a long term strategy. So it is upon the executive, executive managers, the business owners, and even the customers to create an environment that will foster the achievement of the BL approach in their businesses. Because this is the only way to remedy the short terminism and adopt the sustainable, the sustainability way. So let's look at the good ESG practices. So despite the limitations, we say it is still possible, actually very possible for companies to act long-term in short-term world by developing and implementing and communicating their uh, sustainability practices, that is ESG, the environmental, social, and good governance strategies. By communicating this, they will be able to achieve their long-term uh, strategy. There are a number of good reasons why a company should take a longer term view of value creation through communication of ESG practices. So these reasons, one could be to build a good reputation. When you're able to communicate your practices, your ESG practices, you're likely to have a good reputation. You're also going to have achieved some of the regulations that are required. And you are also going to uh, mitigate some of uh, legal actions that may come from failure to achieve some of the ESG matters. Another advantage, if you're able to report your, your to communicate your ESG uh, practices, for example, on environment, if you have incorporated a uh, an initiative to reduce emissions, then you are able to gain a, a larger market as the consumers are increasing, uh, transitioning to low carbon products and preferring them over high carbon products. So it will be an advantage and may lead to market growth. So as I conclude, I want us to look at sustainability versus ESG. We have heard much about these two terms, but I want to conclude by recapping what 
the similarities or the difference could be between sustainability and ESG. So basically, sustainability is the process of maintaining change in a balanced fashion in which the exploitation of resources, the direction of investment, the orientation of technological development and institutional change are all in harmony and enhance both current and future potential to meet the human needs and aspirations. So also to just recap sustainability, the, there were three concepts that you have covered, the aspect of environment, the social, and even the economic section, uh, aspect. So those are the three pillars of sustainability. But remember when we mentioned the SDGs, they brought another other two concepts of peace and partnership to this concept of sustainability. So although sustainability and ESG are similar, there is one main difference. While sustainability can mean different things to different companies, ESG provides a very specific framework for companies to report their environmental, social, and governance issues. So that is the core difference. ESG is very specific on, uh, and it's a framework for reporting matters on, on environmental, social, and governance performance. However, both concepts ensure long-term business success while contributing towards economic and social development, uh, as well as a healthy environment and a stable society. So that's a similarity that both of them ensure sustainable development and a healthy environment and stable societies. Although the finance sector does not have direct significant environmental and social footprint compared to manufacturing or extractive industry or sectors, the, it plays a pivotal role in contributing to sustainable development. So it is not to mean that only the companies or, uh, or organizations in manufacturing or extractive activities have uh, the responsibility to contribute to sustainable development, even the finance sector, they have their own ways of contributing to sustainable development. And even the, the SMEs also have their place in contributing to sustainable development at their level. At this point, having covered the concept of sustainability in the related terms, I would like to take uh, any question that may arise from the concept or comments before I hand over to the next panelist. So perhaps as uh, we go on, you can put any question that arises in the chat. We'll be happy to respond to you. So I thank you so much for your attention. And at this point, I welcome uh, the CEO at MK Africa to take us through the next session. Welcome, Mudoni. Perhaps you can tell me if you want me to share or you want to share from your end. Uh, thank you so much, Marcy. I can share um, from my end, but before I go, I, I see there are some questions here where somebody is asking, could you please share the relation between sustainability and shared value? Um, I don't know if you want me to handle that. And I see there is um, a question about CPD and if we'll be assisted with these notes. So this is in the chat. If I could look at the Q&A. Is the Q&A working? 
maybe somebody can put it can mention or put it in the chat it doesn't look like we are getting any questions or maybe somebody ask questions in the chat instead of the q and a okay so maybe what you can do Marcy, is you can respond to the question that has been put up in the chat um it looks like the questions are being put in the chat rather than the Q than in the Q and A. So as I bring up my deck, maybe you can respond to those questions, and then I can be able to answer any questions that come up after that because they're coming up in the chat. So Masi, if you could do that, and then I can share my screen. Okay, thank you. Not only let me stop share is I also respond to that question. You can actually answer them in the chat. Oh, yeah. So please keep the questions coming. We'll also be responding this in the chat. So feel welcome. Thank, Thank you. you. So give me, just allow me a, a minute to bring up my screen. I don't know, do we usually take a break in these sessions or do we go on to the end, Milka? Please go ahead, go ahead with the presentation. Okay. Confirm to me that you can see my screen clearly. Confirm to yes, me that. Yes, thank we can. All right, thank you. And welcome everyone to this section of the presentation. I, I am happy to be here. I'm just, uh... and welcome to this, to this section. I actually want to start us off with a video. So I'm hoping that it will play and um, I'm going to request Patricia or Marcy to let me know if the sound is clear as I start. So I'm playing it now. Employees that participate in green teams or volunteer within the community take the energy they get. Is it clear? Can that be heard? Yes, yes. all good. Okay. Employees that participate in green teams or volunteer within the community take the energy they get from those activities and build on it while working their day jobs, says Bob Willard, a sustainability author and speaker. Bob says that HR hasn't traditionally aligned itself closely to social and environmental issues, but it's something they should consider paying attention to now. That energy comes back to the workplace. They're more productive, they're more engaged, and their performance goes up. That hasn't been well tracked before, quantified before, and there's better and better data that shows that these themes, these environmental and so social themes, the fact that the company cares and is doing something about them, um, are extremely energizing and engaging for employees. Bob says there are five ways sustainability programs can support HR missions. One of them is helping the communities, uh, another one is saving energy, another one is saving water, another one is giving the employees an opportunity to actually talk about the company in a very big sense of pride. And as they do that, the energy that they get from that leads to higher engagement, higher engagement leads to more productivity, higher more productivity leads to better results. A lot of HR folks are trying to generate a, uh, a culture, a high performance culture in the organization. You don't get that unless you're people are pumped, unless they're excited, unless they're engaged. Bob says there are two myths associated with sustainability measures. One is that it takes forever to get the returns, and the second one is that you have to invest a lot of capital to get the returns. Not true at all. You can get an amazing amount in year one, at least 30% of the overall possibility in year one, if you get your employees figuring this out because their behaviors allow them to turn off computers, turn off lights, uh, use elevators less and so on. When they care about that, magic happens and they will figure it out. 
Bob wants human resource professionals to understand they have an opportunity to create real, positive change within their business. I hope they start to have conversations with people in the organization that they might not have had before, especially the people that are working on the, the, um, the energy saving, the community engagement kinds of things, working with schools, all of those kinds of things, uh, because a lot of what those folks are doing ends up with a byproduct that's very related to what the HR function is. The, the role of HR in a company is to get the most productivity out of these very highly paid, well looked after employees create a culture that celebrates that high performance and energize the heck out of them. Turns out that this energy comes from, in some cases, not all cases, in some cases, giving people a chance to connect with these themes. Okay. So I want us to start off just by putting it in the chat in terms of what are you hearing or what, what, what what did you hear in terms of sustainability and the link to HR from that interview that was being shared? You can put it in the chat. And maybe Patricia, you can help me answer, read out what you're hearing. Anybody want to share? Anything that stood out from you in that or in what the role of HR and sustainability is or where the connection lies? Somebody's saying, wow, they're speaking on speed. Okay. Penny, would you like me to play the video again? It's not too long. Did you not get anything from it? Okay, Petronile is saying how environment contributes to HR performance. Okay, but you got this. Okay, I'm sorry about that, Penny. Incorporating sustainability onto the human factor. Mm -hmm. I'm sure we have that's uh, Beatrice. Paul, ensure we have well motivated our staff due to the environment. Mm -hmm. Jasmine, encourage employees to engage in society. Yes, involve HR in achieving sustainability. That was Jasmine and Dorothy says, involve HR in achieving sustainability for the organization and it reflects in their work performance as well, for sure. It helps communications. Mm -hmm. Josephine, thank you. I'll take one last comment and then we can start our, I can start off my presentation. Eric Morebi is saying, um, okay, so first Milka, your, your comments came in together. Milka says employee engagement is connected to sustainability. Eric says, attracting the best employees and retaining them, yes. Victor, HR can achieve sustainability through small uh, weight, small weights. I think maybe that was supposed to be something like, I'm not sure, small ways, like less water and alternative use of lifts, ETC. Josephine says, reduce water consumption. Um, Esther, employees need to be engaged to buy in, doesn't cost much, true all social responsibility of our organization to our community around us. Thank you. And Brenda, how sustainability supports HR missions in the organization to enhance employee productivity. Thank you. You've said it very well. And Anne, how we can draw energy from involving ourselves in community activities and how this energy translates into our work and performance. So thank you very much. It's a bit of an old video and leans more towards um, social aspects of ESG. Masi has done a great job of introducing what ESG is and the distinction between, um, or the, the slight distinction between ESG and sustainability, as well as between sustainability and CSI. So it has given us a very good segue into our discussion today. And um, thank you very much. The video was supposed to be a thought starter for us as we look at what sustainability and human resources, where the linkage is, okay? 
So <clears throat> you probably know about what sustainability is and what reporting is. And I'll just um, give an example though, we'll be talking more about sustainability reporting in this um, presentation. But just to say that it's the practice of companies reporting their economic, social, and environmental impact. And it's a complex process that requires collaboration across the organization to deliver a report that is truly engaging and effective. I don't know how many of you, 162 participants, plus or minus, are engaged in sustainability reporting. But those of you who are doing that in your organization already know by now that it's not an easy process. It's a process that takes anywhere between three months to even depending on how um, elaborate your reporting system is, it can take an entire year. The teams we've worked with tend, tend to take those timelines and um, usually HR is very central to the reporting process. So, Interestingly, 38% of the performance indicators that are included in the GRI standards, and I'm going to be introducing to you what the GRI standards are, um, they're related to HR, okay? So you remember Patricia said at the beginning that MKR, MK Africa is a GRI partner in this region. And so for us, we look at sustainability reporting from the lens of the Global Reporting Initiative, what is known as GRI and which is the world's most widely used sustainability reporting framework. So if you were to look at to look up GRI, if you're not a, um, familiar with the GRI standards, it's freely available on the, on the internet. 38% um, of the performance indicators in those standards, the GRI standards are related to HR and HR management aspects. So this highlights the vital role that HR plays in sustainability and sustainability reporting. Indeed, in our experience, um, about a third of the report is devoted to employee relations. And this underscores again, the strategic participation of HR in this process. And you are just not um, passive providers of data. You're actually very key um, as, as, as HR professionals in the sustainability reporting process for any organization. So in organizations, various departments are responsible for sustainable practices and the HR department is one of the most important for various reasons. And to understand the importance practically and effectively, we must understand the key responsibilities of the HR department um, as it relates to sustainability. So I have there seven roles that I'm going to be looking at and I'm going to be looking at them from a sustainability lens. I'm sure there are other roles that HR plays in the organization that I haven't listed here. And I'm going to encourage you to continue. Let's make this an interactive session. So if there's anything that, you, that comes to mind as I read out um, or go into depth for each of these seven roles or any other role that I may have left out, please put it in the chat so that we can also enhance our knowledge about um, the connection between sustainability and HR. But the seven roles that I'm going to be focused on are one, recruitment, onboarding, and training. Two, creating an ethical culture. Three, the respect for human rights. Four, maintaining employee and em employer employee relations, compensation and reward, regulatory compliance, and seven, leading change okay so going through each of these roles one at a time i'll begin with recruitment and onboarding so recruitment onboarding and training are integral um, functions of hr this is the, the the process through which people join an organization okay hr professionals can make sure that the business strategy succession planning the code of ethics, goals and mission are properly communicated to candidates and new employees at every step of the process. And they start conversations, and that can include starting conversations about waste reduction, energy savings, um, and, and, and et cetera, whatever the, the company's um, sustainability focus is. So organization sustainability programs are boosted when they hire candidates who are interested in implementing and contributing 
to the longevity, um, to the longevity of plants. And especially now, I'm sure you have had these discussions in other forums or that um, the kind of candidates you're getting in, in organizations right now, the Gen Zs, as they're being called, and those younger um, than them, are, in, are very keen on working for organizations whose purpose aligns with their own um, individual purpose as an as an individual. So um, I know you'll find that somebody would select working um, or choose to work in one organization over another just because that organization speaks specifically to um, diversity, for example, and, and, and this person is um, very keen on, on working in an organization that respects diversity or respects their individuality and, and, and things like that, or respects um, or is keen on working for organizations that are contributing, um, are, are keen on reducing their emission. So including that um, and addressing how employees are treated and perceived internally is only one aspect of recruitment and onboarding, but also hiring and onboarding clients who are interested, candidates who are interested in contributing and implementing ESG is a key role for, um, for HR, for the HR department, the HR professionals. So if I was to look at this from the lens of the Global Reporting Initiative or the GRI standards, then you, GRI actually um, covers this very extensively in GRI 401 and 404, where they talk about employment and training and um, education. So GRI focuses on employment practices, emphasizing the importance of effective communication of the business's strategy, goals, and mission to candidates and new employees. So HR professionals play, play a key role in ensuring that these aspects are properly communicated during the recruitment, onboarding, and training processes. You'll also find GRI 404 talking about um, or emphasizing the significance of training and education in developing employee skills and capabilities. So as HR professionals, we can utilize training programs to address sustainability issues, such as waste reduction, energy savings, and et cetera, and therefore, therefore contributing to the organization's um, sustainability goals, okay? Um, so my, I've gone in the wrong direction. And how does this actually align with the sustainable development goals? So those of you who are familiar with the SDGs, SDG 4 emphasizes the importance of quality education and aligns with the notion of training and education mentioned in, the, in, in, um, my, in, in, in this induction and recruitment uh, process, as well as in the ongoing um, training and development needs of organizations, um, employees. So by incorporating sustainability-focused training and education programs, you as HR professionals can contribute to building a workforce that is knowledgeable about and capable of implementing sustainable business practices, okay? And then you have SDG 16, which is about creating, about having peace, justice, and creating strong institutions, okay? So again, here as HR professionals, this links very well with your role in that you ensure that employees are being treated well in the organization, both internally and externally, and by addressing issues related to perception and selection. So you want to hire candidates interested in implementing and contributing to your ESG programs, but also who, whose um, values align with the organization's principles of peace, justice, and creating strong institutions. So in summary, if you look at GRI 401 and 404, which we'll be happy to introduce to you in greater detail, as well as the SDGs 4 and 16, they align very well with this role of recruitment, onboarding, and training um, for the HR professional. So the second um, role that we are looking at is the creating of an ethical values or value system in the organization, okay? So while no single department within an organization can be held responsible for establishing and maintaining an ethical culture, it fits smart 
in this in the in the HR um, role, or uh, to make sure that activities are being coordinated within teams um, responsible for ethics, sustainability, and compliance, as well as other key units within the organization. So. The idea is that HR is able to ensure that there is collaboration to establish a shared um, and value-driven um, culture, shared value-driven culture. So organizations that have recently adopted the concept of sustainability within their systems would need to learn and to create a harmonious culture, uh, focused not just on economic factors, but also on social factors, including people engagement, and of course, looking at the relationship with the environment, okay? So your culture should not only look at um, your social and economic factors, but also what is the environmental, um, what is the organization's relationship with its environment? And this can be accomplished by opening, by having um, open communications and practices such as regular meetings uh, between senior management and employees and stakeholders, as well as having a holistic HR capability that reviews HR policies regularly so that you're keeping up to date with trends, particularly in this um, ESG sector. Okay. And then if I was to relate this to the GRI standards, then you'd have standards like GRI 405, which are um, concerned about uh, diversity and equal opportunity. And if you look at the GRI standards, there's also GRI 406, which talks about non-discrimination. So these are, again, part of your have been tasked in HR currently um, to come up with um, what, you know, to define what is the organization's culture. Then we can guide you to, um, to look at the GRI standards. And as I said, if you look at GRI 405, it emphasizes the importance of promoting diversity and establishing a shared culture that values diversity and equal opportunity, and you can find that in GRI 406, okay? And then you also perhaps, as an HR professional, want to refer to the SDGs when it comes to creating that ethical culture within the organization. And there you have SDG 8, which aims to promote decent work and economic growth. And um, by coordinating activities with other teams, the HR department can contribute to creating values-driven cultures that um, a values-driven culture uh, that supports the principles of decent work and economic growth. You can also go to um, your SDG number eleven, which is about creating sustainable cities and communities. And there you look at the relationship between employees and their physical surroundings and human and HR uh, professionals can contribute to creating a harmonious culture that aligns with the principle of having, you know, um, at paying attention to environmental issues. If you remember the video, it was something simple issues like switch off the lights when they're not being used. I know many organizations are so guilty of having the lights on the whole day. And this is, can be part of your corporate culture to never have lights on during the day, to always use the lift, to always, um, and other to always use the stairs, to um, avoid printing or to have a paperless um, organization. So these are all aspirations which HR can speak to as part of creating an ethical value system in the organization. And this again also links to having um, your SDG 12 on responsible consumption and production. So adopting sustainability within organizational systems, such as um, how to, you know, just the, the examples I've given, for example, are all about responsible consumption and production. If you print less, you use less paper, okay? So you don't need to have 10 people taking 10 different um, Ubers to go to the same meeting. They can carpool, yeah, and save on, on fuel. And, and, and that would not only translate to a saving on the bottom line of the organization, but also translates to your achieving SDG 12 as an organization, okay? Many other examples which we can explore, but I'd like you to think about it from that perspective, okay? So, um, there's a respect for human rights 
yeah, which is again in the HR department in, is um, the HR department again. Whenever we are talking about the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which lays out the fundamental right to just and favorable conditions of work, I'm sure you as HR professionals are very much aware of this. And the respect for human rights, this is a very key sustainability aspect or angle um, discussion when it comes to sustainability and in terms of what is important. So again, here what you're looking at is issues to do with occupational health and safety, which are very um, covered in the GRI standards, GRI 43, or issues to do with child labor, ensuring that you're hiring people who are of the correct age or as, as, as of the legal age. And then there is no forced or compulsory, compulsory labor. Okay. And then we can also link this to SDGs 1, 5, 8, and 10. So SDG one is about um, eradicating poverty. So by ensuring just and favorable working conditions, you know, paying people well, advocating for fair pay, then you are promoting the, the reduction of property and can actually proudly say that you're contributing to that particular SDG, okay? And then um, SDG five, talks about gender equality and the role of the human resources department in this area is to mitigate risks to employees' rights, including equal protection against discrimination and aligning with the principles of gender equality, making sure that all employees are getting fair opportunities um, for growth and advancement of work. Then you have SDG 8, which focuses on decent work and economic growth. And here again, we are saying by managing and mitigating risks to employees' rights, the HR department or HR professionals such as yourselves contribute to creating an environment that supports decent work and economic growth. And then, of course, we have reducing inequalities, which is again linked to um, priority identifying and assessing and prioritizing human rights issues in your policy formulation, as well as just ensuring that there's favorable um, working conditions for all employees as I've mentioned earlier. Okay. I'm hoping that their questions are being answered if they're in as we go along, because I'm not looking at the chat currently, but I'm sure Marcy and uh, Patricia are doing that. So then we have maintaining Peace, respect, understanding, and justice at work, and it is important to avoid or minimize conflict as much as possible um, within the organization. And again, this is something that speaks directly to the role of the HR professional in the organization. So here you're looking at um, issues like um, labor and, and manage labor and management relations, which focus on you know how are you how um, organizations, your employees, are they allowed to join unions? Are they unionizable? Um, do they, what is the importance of having constructive relationships between employers and employees? And of course, um, communicating that and promoting cohesion. Yeah? And then looking at the needs and demands of both employers and employees to create a work environment that supports decent work and economic growth. And then of course, just making sure that there is um, strong institutions, you know, that you're focusing on um, work for promotion of economic growth. You notice there's a lot of overlap within the SDGs. And I think Marcy mentioned that when she was introducing the SDGs which makes the role of understanding sustainability in the SDGs very easy because it's very just by doing what you're supposed to be doing in the organization and doing it well, you can be able to address many of the concerns that are covered in majority of the SDGs. So another key HR role is looking at compensation and awards. And I think I've mentioned that um, quite um, a lot in previous um, in, in, in the in previous slides that HR makes sure that employees are paid fairly for the nature and amount of work that they do. So this is something that sometimes, I don't know, maybe in my experience, I've seen HR say, you know, take that to your boss, but actually,
that employees are paid fairly, and that in sustainability in this case, can you hear me? Can I be heard? Yes. Okay. You can be heard. I've got an alert that my internet connection is unstable. Okay. So sustainability in this case can be encouraged among employees by offering rewards or incentivizing them to follow performance well and showcase organizational values in their work and behavior. So as part of your performance appraisals, can, employees can be encouraged to show how they have been able to address sustainability concerns, the organization's sustainability concerns, and be compensated and awarded for that. Okay? Um, and, and, and there are various GRI standards and SDGs that speak to this. Um, there's GRI 2, for example, which requires the general disclosures um, relating to how the organization is approaching sustainability. Is it within your sustainability policy to recognize employees for doing um, extraordinarily well in meeting sustainability KPIs? And then you'll find <clears throat> GRI 47, which again talks about um, freedom of, no, sorry, I was going to say SDG 8, again, as I said earlier, for decent work and economic growth. In addition, just looking at aligning this with how well you recognize employees for their ability to meet your sustainability um, objectives in a, as an organization. Okay, so the role of the HR department, the HR professional, is ensuring that there is alignment with this and with um, the SDGs and with the sustainability policies of the organization, and ensuring that. Um, there is fair compensation and respecting of employees' rights to association and collective bargaining. Okay, so that and actually the right to assist, freedom of association and collective bargaining is very well covered in GRI for all seven. And then HR also has a key role to play in ensuring this regulatory compliance. Okay. So HR ensures compliance with existing labor laws. I think that's something that we're very familiar with. And you need to prohibit all forms of discrimination at the workplace, respect minimum wages, and ensure compliance with health and safety related laws. Okay, those are just some of the examples of how regulatory compliance comes in. So this is again, very much linked with your sustainability um knowledge and reporting so for example in gri there are standards that cover anti-corruption anti-competitive behavior and um they cover tax and you also find sdgs 12 16 and 17 covering this so if i was to start with um the gri standards so you'd find that the gri standards 205 focuses on anti-corruption practices and the role of the hr department is to ensure compliance with labor laws Prohibit, um, prohibiting um, any in instances where there's corruption in the hiring process or there's corruption that is actually maybe brought to HR's attention from the proc uh, procurement perspective and just ensuring that there's an alignment um, with anti-corruption. And also this again links with what whistleblowing policies do you have as an organization and how well are these policies being implemented? So this is again um, how HR makes sure there's regulatory compliance across the organization. Then there is anti-competitive behavior, ensuring com compliance with labor laws and prohibiting discriminatory practices and preventing, of course, this is at the marketplace, but again, there's a HR element to it to ensure that this comes up in the KPIs of especially the sales and and the uh, and the marketing department that they are adhering to anti-competitive laws, and then tax practices. So HR is, is to ensure, has a responsibility to ensure that the labor taxes are being paid and are being paid responsibly and are being paid in a timely manner. Okay. And that's part of your compliance. Then you have um, 
relevant SDGs that link to compliance. We talked about responsible consumption, um, and, and that's just making sure environmental laws are being adhered to if you have any in, the, in your area of operation, and that comes um, and, and, and ensuring that this is again being included in the KPIs of staff within the organization. And then there is SDG 16 and 17 in terms of um, respecting minimum wages, and these are all part of the indicators for this SDG, ensuring that you're paying a minimum wage, a decent minimum wage at the very least, and then um, ensuring that you're promoting ethical practices within the organization. So that's for um, SDG 16 as well. And partnering with relevant organizations outside of your organization to implement um, the, the various SDGs. So being members of, for example, IHRM, and attending a webinar such as this one is a way of you being able to promote partnership for the goals. If you will then take this to, um, to your organizations and start implementing um, these SDGs as part of your day-to-day -day HR practice, okay? So HR, can, and then now, the, the, I think this is the last role that you play as HR professionals that I have listed down, but there are others that you may have on your, on your end, but you are the leaders of change. So I commend IHRM for organizing this webinar because many organizations are still to get the grasp of what sustainability means and how it applies to them as an organization. And having um, at least a few, 150 of you on this call, I'm hopeful that some of you will go back to the organization and start leading the change towards having more sustainable business practices. So you can bring about positive changes in the workplace um, because of the role that you play, the key central role that you play as HR professionals. And that could be, for example, by encouraging the use of automated processes or software to avoid the use of paper, um, that's creating a positive impact on the environment and reducing the use of plastic at the workplace. Um, another aspect which HR could lead change to is by encouraging volunteering. Those of you who aren't doing this already, allow employees to participate in workplace volunteer programs, to take time off to serve or to pursue um, interests that have a sustainability related, um, that are good for people or for the environment, for example. Um, and, and you can nominate organizations or causes that can be supported. You know, that's HR's role. Again, you can lead, point people in the organization in the right direction. Okay? So you must embrace better behavior to provide a seamless flow of events and activities, efficient use of finite resources because they are finite and they're running out, especially energy and water, and a conducive working environment. So the alignment of HR to responsible practices allows the corporate sustainability of an organization as a whole to be possible. So you have a very key role to play in that aspect. And this, of course, you can find even in the GRI standards, GRI 2 on your general disclosures, and it has been covered quite adversely even in the SDGs that I have mentioned um, previously. So, and actually, I can bring them up on the screen again. We have SDG 8, 9, 12, 16, and 17. So, these are all SDGs that could align with you as a HR professional leading the change in your organization. So, I'll pause there for a minute and ask if there are any roles that you feel HR could play when it comes to sustainability that I may have left out. You can put it in the chat. Um, I see there's quite a number of discussions that have happened since I last looked. But is anyone, um, can anyone think of any, any role the HR can play that I may have left out? Just thinking of your role as a HR professional. I see Elizabeth said, another aspect that HR can drive contri is contributing to alleviating poverty through youth employment programs in its talent developed strategy. Excellent. Yes, that's a, a fantastic example um, by having youth programs. I guess this would be management trainees and, and programs such as that. And I see the, a number of people have agreed with you there. 
or maybe the answer is yes to something else. I'm not sure. Should I can I continue? My internet connection is unstable. I hope you can still hear me. Paul Onyango is asking, how do I get the GRI standards? I'm hoping this is being answered, but you can get them. I think, yes, I can see Massive is tackling that. All right, you can share actually the GRI website too with the participants so that they can download the standards from there. Okay. So thank you very much. I'll now move on. And I wanted to just highlight, as, as was mentioned earlier, we have uh, one of our clients is Sassini, um, who recently published the inaugural sustainability report. And we just wanted to highlight some of the areas that were covered from a HR perspective um, in that report. So they had five key areas. They talked about their employment practices, their diversity and inclusion, human capital and development, fair wages and benefits, and occupational health and safety, okay? So starting with employment practices, what Sassini included, and, and by the way, you can actually download this report from their website. And, and you can follow through on what I'm, I'm reporting and you can refer to that later. But some of the aspects that were covered in the report included compliance with their labor laws. And as you know, they're an agricultural concern, um, engaged in tea and coffee production um, as some of their, their primary activities. They also uh, grow and sell avocados and macadamia nuts. So they reported compliance with labor laws and regulations governing employment practices to ensure a safe, healthy work environment. They talked about their compensation of their employees and fair comp compensation and benefits and protection against discrimination and harassment. So first of all, you'd find that in the introduction section of the report, what we call the GRI2 section of the report, they talk about what is the employee composition. And that's, this is Mr. Sini report and it's in a standard um, feature in every report written using the GRI standard. So if you were to start um, sustainability reporting, one of the things that you must report on is what's your employee composition? How many men do you have in the organization? How many women do you have in the organization? How do those figures compare with previous years? How many men do you have on, um, or, or rather, how many women do you have in senior management and board position? How does this um, compare with previous years? Another thing that you'd find in that report, or in a sustainability report, um, written with the GRI standards is leave provision. How, um, how many people went on leave during the reporting period compared to the previous reporting period? How many new people were hired? And when we talk about leave, sorry, we talk about both maternity and paternity leave. We talk about how many new people were hired in that organization um, within the reporting period, which is usually 12 months. What training and capacity building programs did the organization have during um, the reporting period? What talent management and retention programs did you run as an organization within the reporting period? And always this is in comparison to previous periods. Now, why that is important is it's, it's, it's to make sure that you're making progress towards good. And if there's anything that has stood in the way of, for example, hiring more women or hiring uh, people um, from diverse backgrounds, for example, people with, um, who are differently able, um, if that's part of your policy, if there's anything Okay, I hope you can still hear me. Am I online? Can I be heard? Hello? No, we can hear you, Madonna. Okay. Um, yeah, so training, I don't know now, I've lost my train of thought, but if there's anything, so basically I was giving what you would expect um, to find in the introduction section of any sustainability report, and certainly this was covered in the Sassini report. 
and then you'd um the other elements that were covered and and is um diversity and inclusion so although women make up 40 percent of Sesame's workforce they were also quite a number of men in managerial and non-managerial positions and um by the end of 2022 Sesame had made progress in gender diversity with 43 percent of its managers and board of directors being female so this is what you'd find under diversity and inclusion as a key highlight then in human capital and development, the Sassini recruitment process adheres to strict guidelines on non-discrimination and fairness, um, regardless of gender and ethnicity. And so beyond providing jobs and caring for direct employees through comprehensive benefits and schemes, they also invested in training to upskill personnel to be future ready. Yeah. Um, so you'd find that they had um, various forms and forums such as employment and engagement service, which they talked about in this section of the report. When it comes to fair wages and benefits, what they talked about is their policy for equal pay, regardless of gender, and the benefits and packages that they have and how they have cl clustered them in the various job groups as set out in their HR manual. And so this was covered in that section of the report. And then if you look at uh, what they reported on, on occupational health and safety, which was quite a, a significant portion of their report because of the nature of their work, Sassini talked about planning to provide regular training and education for employees and contractors to promote awareness of occupational health hazards and safety um, at work practices. And we talked about their goals and targets in terms of um, having more robust policies in terms of um, the training of, of employees to promote workplace safety and health. And the fact that they're, they're, they're protecting their employees by having these policies. Okay. So that's just an example um, of some of the of the of the issues that were covered in the sustainability report for Sassin. Okay. Any questions before I carry on? So this looks like a bit of a contradiction. I should probably, but it has been mentioned and, and alluded to severally. But I thought that I should come, you know, I should sort of conclude my presentation by giving a more comprehensive or the GRI um, standards definition of what sustainability reporting is, okay? So as I mentioned, we focus a lot on the GRI standards because we are GRI's partner in this region, but that's not to say that we cannot report using other standards, which we, we also do depending on the needs of our clients. So the G GRI defines sustainability reporting as a process of reporting which starts with an organization determining its material topics. So these are material topics are based on its most significant impacts and results in the organization publicly reporting information about these impacts. Okay. So um, sustainability reporting has both internal and external benefits. And I'm going to just go through some of them for you to see. So starting with um, internal benefits. So if you were to start on the journey of sustainability reporting, some of the benefits for you would be setting the vision and strategy for the organization um, by placing the organizational purpose, vision, and strategy into the wider context of sustainable development. So it's almost like you, you, you expand your scope as an organization and not just look at what um, your vision and strategy are for an organization, but also how does it contribute to the wider goal of sustainable development, which was introduced by Marcy Allen. This will help make abstract issues more, become more tangible and concrete for you as an organization. The other benefit is it helps you measure performance. So I've mentioned KPIs quite a bit, but what sustainability reporting does is it requires you to have comprehensive and efficient management system. So this improves the quality of data and contributes to the distribution of this data. This data tracking is actually a key element of sustainability reporting because it creates opportunities for you to improve 
to be more efficient and to have various cost savings. So it helps you set goals, measure performance and manage change within the organization. And then there's the element of risk. So early identification of emerging issues is a, is a benefit or an outcome of sustainability reporting. Therefore, as an organization, you're able to either seize opportunities and event, evaluate uh, potentially damaging developments before they occur, okay? And then finally, I think speaking to you as HR professionals, and this would be one of your more important benefits perhaps, would be sustainability reporting engages in the workforce, engages the workforce in sustainability efforts, thus increasing productivity, attracting new talent and reducing absenteeism. Okay? So it's a huge motivator, especially for the younger employees. Externally, the sustainability reporting helps build reputation and trust uh, by having proactive and transparent communication that is a result of sustainability reporting. Then um, employees and, and, and other external stakeholders as well are able to trust um, your organization more because you're disclosing more. And therefore, they're able to, you're able to reduce your reputational risk as an organization while improving product image, as well as your brand name. You're also able to attract capital. So reducing risk through sustainability management and communication helps signal quality, good management and secure investment. So you're able to uh, provide potential for new sources of capital and lower costs because investors are looking and want to see this information. And, and this is a, a key benefit as well. Then there is the engagement of stakeholders that is a mandatory uh, require, requirement when it comes to sustainability reporting. You must engage stakeholders as part of the sustainability reporting process. And um, so this is a powerful tool for you as HR professionals, not only to engage with your employees who are, who are your key stakeholders, but also with external stakeholders to know what the expectations are for you as an organization, even as it relates to your, how you employ organization. And then we've talked about um, regulatory requirements. And, and this is important because it's now, for those of you who are representing organizations from um, who are, that are listed in the Nairobi Securities Exchange, it's now a requirement for you to report using the GRI guidelines that have been provided by the Nairobi Securities Exchange and also CMA who require you to report on sustainability as part of the code of corporate governance, among other regulatory requirements. Okay. So I'm just gonna pause now as we come to the tail end of this presentation. And I'm going to ask the question, if just looking at these benefits, what for you, stood out, please put it in the chat, as the most material HR um, benefits for you and the organization of, of engaging in sustainability reporting and sustainability engagement. What is the most material for you? Please share that in the chat. Any question, any comments? Uh -huh. Flora says motivated employees, that's good. I guess that would be a natural for HR. Um, any other? Any other benefits that's standing out for you? Business efficiency and effectiveness. Simon, you must be talking about, let me put them back up on the screen. So, so far you're talking about the internal benefits. Simon also talks about the morale, the increase in morale. Very well. And please state why, why, why do you think so? Well-informed staff, Paul, thank you. Why do you think these are, are key benefits? And think about it from the perspective of your own organization.
Okay. Any other comments? I can take one last one. In terms of what is standing out to you most externally, I've heard a lot about internal benefits, which is, as I said, expected for you as HR profession. Agility. Is supported by sustainability. Thank you, Catherine. Agility, yes, for sure. You're able to iterate fast in terms of your business strategy. Care for employees economically and socially. Thank you, Bernadette. Any of the external benefits that's, that stand out for you? Any of the external benefits? Elizabeth is saying a responsible business, one that practices sustainability is one that will remain relevant, grow and be here in the long run. Yes. If you've ever listened to Safari Com as they're launching their sustainability, sustainable business report, they always say they're here to be in business for the next 100 years. So for sure, thank you, Elizabeth. Simon, it's because having the standard, it sweeps out the notion of negative thinking towards the company. So the building of reputation and trust. Thank you. Yeah, that's a key external benefit. Okay. Another one, long-term community growth. Thank you, Penny. Yeah, long-term community, and which is very much linked with the engagement with stakeholders. Sustainability reporting helps you and makes sure that you keep engaging with your stakeholders. Yeah, which has the long-term benefit of um, community growth. Okay. Lucy K, empo employee retention and attracting competent workforce, building reputation and trust. So thank you very much, Lucy and everyone um, for your comments. What is the purpose of the, I, I, I want to spend the last few minutes um, of this conversation just to, looking at um, the purpose of the GRI standards to introduce them to you because I'm hoping that this will spur or lead to an even deeper engagement with, um, with you through IHRM on how we can be able to talk about um, or to conduct GRI training. So the GRI standards, as I mentioned, are the most uh, public, the most, uh, actually, let me bring up this slide. So first of all, you may be wondering who's GRI. It's an independent, um, international independent standards organization that helps businesses, governments, and other organizations understand and communicate their impact on issues such as climate change, human rights, and um, on corruption, okay? So they are the most widely used sustainability reporting standards, not only across the world, but also here in Kenya. Most of the organizations that are engaged in sustainability reporting are actually using the GRI standards. So the purpose of the GRI standard is to enable an organization to publicly disclose its most significant impacts on the economy, environment, and people, including impacts on their human rights, which is important to you as HR professionals, and how you manage these impacts in a consistent and credible way. And I've given you some examples in this presentation. So reporting information using the GRI standard supports information users in making informed assessments about how your organization is impacting the environment um, and society and the economy and how you're, you're performing against expectations in, um, in from, from various sources, okay? So the main features of the GRI standards is that they are interconnected. I think that has been very clear from some of the examples I've shared that they are developed by an independent, transparent, and a multi-stakeholder process. So people sometimes tend to think that GRI is a regulator of sorts. No, GRI is not a regulator. They, have, they just give you guidelines that are based on the standards that they have developed independently as an NGO. And um, they're very, in a very transpar transparent and multi-stakeholder process. And they are based on expectations for responsible business conduct as set out in authoritative intergovernmental instruments, such as, as you've had me already mention, um, the UN um, guiding principles on business and human rights, 
or the OECD framework or guidelines for multinational enterprises and um, similar such um, instruments. Any organization, regardless of the sector it's in, its size or its location can use the GRI standards. They are not, for, they are, they are not limited only to the listed organizations or to the big companies. Actually, SMEs are also quite um, are encouraged and do use the GRI standards for their reporting. Certainly, we do at MK Africa. So they include a set of requirements and reporting principles, and they require organizations to identify impacts and report on material topics. And as I mentioned, these are um, they're freely available on the internet. I hope by now a link has been shared with you so that you can be able to download them from the GRI website. Some of the benefits of GRI are enhanced knowledge and skills needed for the use of GRI sustainability reporting standards. So these are some of the benefits of taking a GRI um, reporting course. You can also get professional recognition from trusted sources um, such as ourselves. And then improve the, they improve the quality of your sustainability reporting. You're able to upskill and gain competitive, a, a competitive edge in your career, as well as strengthen your sustainability reporting credentials. Okay. Um, I think I've already talked about the fact that GRI is international um, and that it's, it's, it's most widely used by MK Africa. Yeah is a certified partner for GRI in this region. And we offer an online training course every other month. I think our next course is in July and we can share those bits with you through IHRM. We also have in-house training programs for organizations. It usually takes three days. The online course takes five days. And the program offers benefits that I have listed um, for you in the, in the previous slide, okay? And um, yeah, I will. I welcome all of you to take it to take our course. I think the other thing that I would like to emphasize is that we offer follow up coaching to the training participants to help them in your sustainability reporting um, journey and process. And we also help you prepare for the professional certification examination that is offered by GRI. And all this we do, we can do with you um, in partnership with IHRM. So that's, I've come to the end of my presentation for today. I'm going to hand over to Patricia in the last two minutes to share with you the, our feedback form so that you can tell us or share any feedback that you may have from this webinar. And I look forward to engaging with you again in the near future. Thank you. Thank you, Madoni, for the presentation. I have posted the survey on the chat. Um, those in attendance, maybe you can confirm on the chat if you are able to access the item. And just put yes on the chat if you are able to fill in the survey. Thank you, Clarence, for your confirmation. Thank you, Penny and Sita.